Good evening everyone and uh, welcome today to our bathroom. Now you might think this is a very strange place to be doing a sermon and you're right but things are going to become clear over the next few minutes as to why this evening I'm standing in my bathroom speaking to you on Facebook Live. We take bathrooms for granted don't we? Uh, but of course in many parts of the world it's a, it's a luxury, something that is unattainable. The bathroom is the place where we get clean. Many of you have been doing your gardens this week and maybe you came in from the garden with uh, filthy dirty hands and, uh, and sweaty feet and aching legs and it was so nice wasn't it to be able to get into a bath of hot water and just to chill and relax and soothe those aching limbs. Maybe when you've been out for your daily exercise this week, it's been great to be able to come home and to enjoy a, a shower, to refresh you, to wash your sweaty body, and once again, to ease those aching limbs. At this time, when we're all being encouraged to uh, wash our hands regularly and thoroughly, it's great to have the facilities to be able to do that so easily in our own homes as we wash our hands in the sink to my right which you cannot see uh, and a bathroom is a place where we get clean. In Jesus's day the act of washing a guest's feet before a meal was a common one in a culture when walking on hot dusty roads in open basic sandals was an everyday part of life. And the resultant sweaty, smelly feet would have been very unpleasant to put up with at a meal table, especially in the reclining position that people used to eat in those days. But to wash your feet in Jesus's day didn't mean you could go to the privacy of a nice bathroom. In those days, it was the task of the most menial servant to fetch a bowl of water, kneel at the traveller's feet and wash their feet. No soap, no protective clothing. It was an unpleasant task. This evening we're going to be reading from John chapter 13, which points us to the need that we all have to be washed, really washed. So let me read to you those words from John chapter 13 that are often read on Maundy Thursday. John 13, beginning at verse 1. It was just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel round his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel wrapped around his waist. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realise now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said, not everyone was clean. This is the word of the Lord. Here in chapter 13, John records for us the Passover meal being shared by the disciples. So far, nothing unusual. As the food is served, someone gets up, fetches a basin, wraps a towel around his waist and prepares to wash the disciples' feet. So far, nothing unusual. 
But then we see who is doing this. Not a servant, not one of the disciples. It is Jesus himself kneeling before them, getting to ready to wash their tired, sweaty, smelly feet. The disciples are shocked. Peter is indignant. If this Jesus really is someone greater, come to do something bigger, why on earth would he take on the role of a servant and do the most menial task imaginable? To the disciples, that is a task for someone smaller. These are not the actions of someone who claims to be the son of God, who's come to bring fullness of life. Even today, washing someone's feet in this way is an act of humility and service. But that gets us nowhere near understanding the true significance of what Jesus is doing here. There's a phrase that John uses in this chapter which demonstrates this. In verse 1, he says, he showed them. He showed them. Jesus showed them who he really was and what he had come to do. Not that he hadn't showed them before in the time they'd spent with him. But now as he approaches his death in the most countercultural way, he shows them what it means to live and grow deeper in a relationship with him. And verse 15 tells us that having shown them, he now expects them to respond. The gospel, the good news of Jesus, is communicated by words which identify Jesus as someone greater. But those words carry commendation when they are shown in the lives and actions of those who believe that he has come to do something bigger in our world. He showed them. Jesus washing the disciples' feet isn't just a humble thing to do. The words that Jesus speaks around this action help us to understand the true significance of that obvious outward act that he was doing in the room at that Passover. But of course, this sign, this outward act, may not be one of John's seven signs, but it is still incredibly significant. This sign of service and humility point to an even bigger work of service and humility that Jesus was up to undertake just 24 hours later on a hill outside Jerusalem. And this evening, on this Maundy Thursday, I want to encourage us to look beyond the obvious outward acts to see the true significance of what Jesus was doing, not just for his disciples, but for us as well. In the most extraordinary way, in the most countercultural way, he was demonstrating that he is someone greater, come to do something bigger. I'm going to share three simple ways from this passage that he shows that. First of all, he shows it by encouraging us to see his love in action in our lives. His love in action in our lives. Verse 1, it tells us that he showed them the full extent of his love. I love that phrase, the full extent of his love. An alternative translation will be he loved them to the end. He loved them at the beginning and he loved them to the end. Relationships today are often seen as economic transactions. We look at a relationship and we ask, what am I going to get out of this relationship? And is it worthy of what I'm going to need to put in in order to get out? If we enter into that relationship on that basis, it seems like a good economic transaction. If it disappoints and we find we're not getting out of it what we hoped, then we simply get out of it. 
because to stay in it would be to dehumanise us, so we're told. Our needs are not being met. And we see that in so many relationships today, in sexual relationships, in work relationships, in community relationships, dare I say it, even sometimes in church relationships. Jesus is showing us here that relationships are not economic transactions. Jesus demonstrates that when we talk about love in action, when we show the full extent of our love, when we love to the end, there is something more going on than just a transaction. Jesus is loving them despite his impending death. Jesus is loving them despite their unworthiness. Think about the people he is showing the full extent of his love to at this point. Judas, the man who was about to betray him. In verse 26, Jesus calls him out about what he is going to do, but it doesn't stop him washing Judas's feet. It doesn't stop him sharing the bread and the cup with him. Peter. Peter is about to deny him. In verse 38, Jesus calls out Peter for what he is going to do. But it doesn't stop Jesus washing Peter's feet. It doesn't stop Jesus sharing the bread and the cup with Peter. And that was true for all of the disciples. Even though Jesus knew they were about to forsake him, it didn't stop him washing their feet and sharing the bread and the cup with them. Jesus never saw relationships as an economic transaction. Even at this point in his life, when he had every right to expect his friends to surround him and to support him, not to betray, abandon and forsake him. But Jesus still loves them to the full extent. For us to show this quality of love in our own lives, we first of all have to see it at work in our own experience. God loves us not because of who we are or what we've done, not because he sees potential in us, something he can get out of us. God loves us because he loves us. Even when, like those first disciples, we mess up big time, he still continues to show the full extent of his love that he might draw us back into a living relationship with him. Without the security of knowing and seeing the full extent of God's love to us, we can never follow Jesus. Because we will always be looking over our shoulder. And we can never serve him more deeply because we will always run out of resources. In this act in the upper room, but most of all on the cross, Jesus shows us that he is someone greater whose love is so much bigger than we could imagine. We used to sing the children's chorus, didn't we? About the love of Jesus being very wonderful. So high we can't get over it. So low we can't get under it. So wide we can't get around it. That is the extent of Jesus' love. That he showed to the disciples in the upper room. And he wants to show to us this evening. The second thing is that we need to see his cleansing action in our lives. Verse 10, Jesus says this, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean. Now, in the conversation with Jesus, it seems Peter was only looking at the obvious external act of washing. He wasn't seeing the true significance of what Jesus was doing. To understand what Jesus is saying here, you need to understand the way the Bible sees sin. The Bible uses all kinds of metaphors and pictures for sin. But the most common idea is that sin makes us unclean. It separates us from a holy God. It makes us impossible to come into his presence. 
The discussion between Jesus and Peter about washing and bathing, Peter takes literally, but Jesus is using it as a metaphor, as a metaphor for his cleansing, cleansing action in our lives that doesn't make us clean on the outside, but deals with the real heart of the human problem, the problem of sin that separates us from God. Peter's confusion and inability to look beyond the obvious is seen as he sink, swings from one extreme to the other. One minute he doesn't even want his feet washed. The next minute he's saying, plunge me in the bath and let me have the water all over me. What is Peter saying here? Let me try and explain using this picture. Spiritually speaking, we need a bath once, but we need our feet washed regularly. Water, again, has several different meanings in scripture, but the one that Jesus is using here is of cleansing in our lives. Jesus is saying to Peter, Peter, you're saved. You don't need to get saved again. But you still do need to allow me to deal with the sins that still afflict your life and prevent you from following me. Peter, you need to get your feet washed. Because walking in this world means you get dirty feet. But that doesn't mean you need to jump in the bath and get saved all over again. Now this is pastorally important. If we are to be followers of Jesus in our world today, we all know that we live in a very different culture. We don't walk dirty paths in open-toed sandals all the time anyway. But even with closed shoes on paved streets, our feet get sweaty and smelly and need washing. And that's a symbol. As we walk as followers of Christ in the world, we get tainted by sin which we need to confess, and we need Christ to cleanse us anew by his forgiveness. And that's what we acknowledge every week in church when we say the confession together. That doesn't mean we need to get saved all over again. But we all know that being saved doesn't mean we don't sin again. There are still sins we need to confess. We won't die for those individual sins, but our experience of Christ's forgiveness means we shouldn't overlook those sins. Our experience of Christ's forgiveness instead will urge us to keep on coming back to Christ every day, thanking him for his cleansing from our sin, but praying that he will cleanse us afresh from those sins that soil us from just our everyday experience of trying to live in a world that is very different from who we want to be and who we are. Jesus can do this for us today. Jesus wants to cleanse us anew. Because as the son of God, he is someone greater. And therefore he has the authority to do this bigger act of cleansing in our lives that no religion, that no uh, philosophy, that no person can do. Because it requires grace and forgiveness. And only God can do that. And when Jesus throughout the Gospels claimed to be able to forgive sins, he was saying more clearly than ever, I am God. I am someone greater. And I have come to do this bigger work of forgiveness in your life. And that is what God wants to do for each of us today. And one final thing, we need to see the cross in action in our lives. In verse 7, uh, Jesus says, you do not realise what I am doing, but later you will understand. What is the basis for this? Well, Jesus tells us in verse 7, although for Peter at this point it remains unthinkable. Later he would understand, and thankfully for us, we are in a position where we can read these words through the lens of the events that we are going to be thinking about tomorrow on Good Friday, and the event we're going to be thinking about on Sunday when we celebrate his resurrection. We don't like the idea of guilt and shame in our culture. 
The way we deal with it is we just pretend that shame and guilt are just rogue voices within us. And we just need to deal with them. We just need to give ourselves a different message. The Bible points to a different way. It doesn't say we find the answer to shame and guilt within us. Instead, it points outside of us. When Jesus says it will all become clear later, he was pointing to his death on the cross. Crucifixion was the most shaming death. It was public. It was humiliating. It was painful. But who was it who allowed himself to be shamed on the cross? And why did he do it? It was God's son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who humbled himself even to the death on a cross. And he did it so that we might be set free from guilt and shame in our lives. The answer the gospel puts forward is not look within yourself, talk to yourself to release yourself from shame and guilt. No, the answer of the gospel is to look to the cross and to the one who died on the cross for you and for me. To come to the conclusion he is someone greater who is doing this something bigger and he's doing it for me. In Pilgrim's uh, Progress, there's a, a point where Christian, burdened by shame and guilt, seeks an answer to his shame and guilt. And he goes to a character called Mr. Worldly Wise. And Mr. Worldly Wise tells Christian that the answer to his shame and guilt is to go to a hill called the Hill of Morality and to climb to the top of the hill where he will find a house where a man called Mr. Legality lives. And Mr. Legality will tell him how to get rid of his burden and shame and guilt. But as Christian starts to climb the hill, the burden gets heavier and heavier until he gives up. He simply can't do it anymore. He goes to another hill. And at the bottom of the hill is a grave with the stone rolled away from the entrance. And as he climbs that hill, in the distance he can see something. He can't quite make out what it is at first. But as he climbs further and the object gets closer, he sees it more clearly. And he sees at the top of this hill is a cross. And as the cross comes into focus, and as he sees it, and as he looks intently at it, so his burden and shame and guilt falls off his back and rolls away down the hill, all the way to the bottom where it rolls into the empty grave. And as Christian is released from his burden of shame and guilt, he leaps for joy and sings this hymn, Blessed cross, blessed grave, blessed rather be the man there put to shame for me. All he had to do was to see the cross for what it was, to look upon the cross and be saved. There's an old hymn we used to sing. Ian Thomas will love this one. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away, it was there by faith I received my sight. And now I am happy all the day. The disciples really didn't get it at this point. But in their situation you could understand why. It was only later that they really understood. And as the light dawned they understood that the one who washed their feet had come as a greater servant. And the one who died on the cross was doing an even bigger work than washing their feet. He had come to deal with the biggest problem of all. He had come to wash away their sins and to wash away our sins. On this Maundy Thursday, as we prepare for Good Friday, will you let Jesus wash away your sins today? 
Will you let Jesus deal with the burden of shame and guilt in your life? Will you let him cleanse you? Make you new? Will you let him give him give you that life to the fullness that John promises he came to give? Will you receive this gift from Jesus this Easter?